So today I am again on Therapy and Theology with two very brilliant men. Thank you guys so much, Dr. Joel Mutamale and Jim Kress, licensed professional counselor. I want to talk about a topic that is complicated and yet is affecting women a lot. And it doesn't just affect women. Obviously, I want to say it affects um, young people um, that are not grown up. It affects men. Um, But for the purpose of our conversation tucked within this series specifically focusing on women I want to talk about emotional abuse Mm -hmm. and the reason that this is so complicated is and there I'm sure there are lots of reasons it's so complicated but when I hear women talking about emotional abuse I either hear it one extreme that they call almost everything emotional abuse. Anything hard, challenging, difficult, um, even like a a corrective criticism or or whatever. Like it swung so far over that they're calling everything emotional abuse. Mm -hmm. Or more commonly what I'm hearing is they call very little emotional abuse because they're nervous to even use that word abuse. It sounds so big and so definitive. Makes it real too in their mind. If I say Mm -hmm. that, oh my word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet it's affecting a lot of people. So instead of trying to break apart, is this emotional abuse? Is this not emotional abuse? I want to just talk about today a spectrum Mm. from a difficult relationship all the way to a destructive relationship. I want to recognize where a difficult relationship turns into a destructive relationship. That has so many nuances, we can't possibly pinpoint it. And yet we can identify that there sometimes is a place where a difficult relationship slips into a destructive relationship. And we can't name that place. Just like we said on our pornography episode that we did that we are going to be descriptive today not prescriptive in Mm -hmm. other words we're going to talk about this issue but we're not trying to prescribe that you or someone you love has this issue Mm -hmm. so another spectrum that i want us to think about is not just difficult to destructive in the context of emotional abuse where does it slip from being just a hard conversation that you have all over to emotional abuse Another spectrum I want to talk about is the spectrum of severity. How severe is this? You know, you've got a criticism maybe on this end or something that just hurts your feelings on this end, um, all the way to verbal abuse on this end. And so there's a spectrum of severity. There's also a spectrum of occurrence. Did it happen once or is it a pattern of behavior that happens all the time? So we've got three different spectrums, if you will, that I want us to kind of keep in the back of our mind Mm -hmm. as we're having this conversation. But here's where I want us to start. I'm going to read a list of some red flags. And again, this is descriptive, not prescriptive. But I just want to see as I read this list, if you would consider this list and see if there's some red flags that exist in some of the relationships that you have that are difficult, possibly even destructive. And I want to start the list by saying, if you feel that you have to trade the best of who you are to protect the worst of who someone else is, that's not just a red flag. That's evidence of possibly a full fire. Mm -hmm. So let me read this list of red flags. They resist needed conversations or turn them against you. For example, when you bring up a topic that needs to be addressed, their denial of the issues at hand and surrounding facts leave you feeling like the crazy one. (laughs) And if you are left feeling like the crazy one after a conversation, a needed conversation, then pay attention to that definite red flag. Another one that I want you to consider, they go back to unhealthy coping mechanisms when they have a bad day or a hard conversation. They lack self-awareness or are emotionally tone deaf. They are Mm -hmm. unable to understand how people perceive them. 
They have an out of proportion reaction to a conversation or a situation at hand that you want to address or that happens. They don't recognize the inappropriateness of their facial expressions, tone of voice, or timing in bringing up certain things. Hmm. They tend not to own any of their parts of a conflict, always saying, but you in response. And they're, they're pinning it back on you mm -hmm. as if you're the real source of the issues that they are displaying. More times than not, you can ask yourself, does this person lack empathy in situations? And do they refuse to consider how their choices will affect the other person? They are unwilling to honor or respect any communicated boundaries. They do not take responsibility for themselves or their actions and expect you to pick up the pieces. They refuse to acknowledge how unhealed trauma from their past, possibly even their childhood, needs to be worked out so it's not acted out. They rewrite history to prove a point that serves only them or their version of the truth. And I want you to pay attention to their version of the truth. Yeah. Because we have to remember sometimes opinions do not equal facts. Mm -hmm. So their version of the truth may not exactly line up with the absolute truth. Their version of reality is not consistent with the facts. Their version of the truth is what protects them, and they really can't discern what is and is not deception. They let their emotions get the best of them and sabotage what would otherwise have been a beautiful moment. Instead of acknowledging or confessing wrongdoing, they sweep it under the rug and hope they're not caught. Hmm. Now, I want to acknowledge as I read that list, you may be thinking, oh, no, <laughs> some of those describe me like I'm doing some of those things. And of course, hmm. you're going to find yourself yeah. in this if you're a self-aware person, because none of us is perfect. But again, I want you to remember those spectrums that we talk about. You know, what's the spectrum of, of occurrence? How often is it happening? And what's the spectrum of severity? Um, and I, I want to say I understand, you know, yeah, so I can sure. find myself in Me some too. of these things. Um, but at least we're self-aware enough to know, hey, that's a call to action. I need to work on that. So if we're progressing toward working on the issues that we recognize, then that's a sign of health and that's a sign of progress. Mm -hmm. But what if you are listening to this list and you're recognizing a lot of those are present in a relationship that I have? That's where I want to consider, are you in a difficult relationship or are you in a destructive relationship? So Jim, and certainly this is not an exhaustive no, list. Right. There's many other descriptions that we could, but I just wanted to get us thinking in the right direction. I know we can't pinpoint the place where we shift from a difficult relationship, like normal difficulties in a relationship to the place where a destructive relationship is happening or that a difficult relationship crosses over into a destructive relationship. But can you help us discern what are some of those evidences that we are in a possibly destructive relationship? Well, thank you. Yes, let's uh, take those items that Lisa has just mentioned, which will also be contained and found in Good Boundaries and Goodbye. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so you can literally see that in print. And I would put a Likert scale on that of one to five. And that is uh, looking at the progression on each one of those statements. That's a one, that's a two, man, that's a five, five, four, whatever else, and tally those up in the end. And I'd look in the word I'm using here is just progression. Does there seem to be a progression? Look at frequency of occurrence again. How often does that happen? If you want to say, well, I do some of that too, that's honest. But to look in there and say, this is, it feels like it's progressed. I always look at, well, has it progressed in the last two years? Are the kids out of the nest? And once the empty nest, did it really progressed? Mm. Whatever. And just take note with a holy contemplation of, hmm, yeah, it's probably this number on all of those. Again, you know me. I'm going to say, how about that list? Don't weaponize it, but you take it in by yourself, not to your spouse, whoever, with a counselor and say, I've noticed this, and I'd really like to sit down and talk about it. By the way, they want to find, find a counselor like our dear mutual friend, Leslie Vernick, who I have spent so much time with. Mm -hmm. Because Leslie just doesn't freak out. She doesn't jump on and bash men 
and a grounded therapist, because sometimes they're not. Therapists can be triggered into their own stuff. And someone says, okay, let's contemplate. Let's take a look at this and have someone. And then once you get the data out facing the reality, what do you want to do with it? It's a whole nother story. That's where that invitation could be. I've done a lot of this, quite frankly, with couples. Can they both come in? Sometimes the woman is would meet criteria for verbal and emotional abuse herself of the husband and say, hey, let's talk about this. Hurt people hurt people. They're not just necessarily trying to be mean, but some outside help to get some some kind of confirmation, yeah, this is what's going on. And I love that you mentioned Leslie Vernick. She's yeah. a friend of both of ours. Mm-hmm. Um, and she has some amazing books around yeah. this mm-hmm. topic. And she really tackles the emotionally destructive relationships. So you can get so much more information from her. And she has support groups. I know she yeah. has a conquer group. Yeah. I'm speaking at it um, at one of her meetings mm-hmm. or conferences that she has. So I definitely encourage that. And then you mentioned my book, Good Boundaries and Goodbyes, mm-hmm. which really does help give ideas of how to draw healthy boundaries, which is often what you're going to need as you get the awareness that maybe this is, maybe it's not even emotionally abusive, but maybe this is dysfunctional Mm -hmm. or all the way to it is emotionally abusive. So how do we draw boundaries that keep us safe? In my book, Good Boundaries and Goodbyes, I'm very clear. We don't put boundaries on another person to try to control them, to try to make them stop, to try to Um, manipulate them into new patterns of behavior or even beg them into Mm -hmm. better actions or better words that they use. But instead we put a boundary on ourself and we say, it's my responsibility to keep myself safe. And so if I recognize this is becoming more than just difficult, this is becoming something that is leading me to the place where I say, I can't take this anymore. Or this is ridiculous. This 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 should not be happening in this relationship. Instead of feeling paralyzed yeah. and swirling in those statements, boundaries give you some logical, practical actions to take that will help you determine that you deserve to be kept safe and here's what I'm going to do about it so that you're not left feeling powerless in a difficult situation. Yeah, and let me just go to the title. Okay, I want to be vulnerable. You know how we do that sometimes, Joel, here off camera, sometimes on camera. I've never asked you this, and if I did, I forget. The steps, logical, practical. Notice the very title of the book. People go too quickly, which I get. They hit the gas. Well, do I need a divorce? And what do I do? And I need to say goodbye. No, 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 no. Notice the title. So I've never asked you. I'm assuming it was planned that way that we start with the steps of progression of Good boundaries first. Don't even worry about the goodbye. Mm -hmm. Good boundaries, then it flows in. If the boundaries are being violated time and time again, you're clear. Clear, remember, a boundary without a consequence is a mere suggestion. You do that and then says, this person just, no matter why, I call it Tai Chi, just they move their hands away and every boundary they're just violating. Then I can be on the cusp of the next part of the book is what about a goodbye? I mean, did you plan it that way in the title? I don't think I ever asked you that. Yeah, you know, I, the subtitle is really important of my book and it is loving others well without losing the best of who you Mm -hmm. are. So this isn't about pushing others away. Right. This is about learning to love others well without making yourself so depleted and so, um, just beaten down by the circumstances Mm -hmm. that the worst version of you is front and center, either because you're being defensive to protect yourself or you're trying to control to yeah. make things better or whatever. So yeah, there's definitely a progression. I want us to fight for love yeah. because love is the cornerstone of, of who God is, you know, and, and who God calls us to be. And we have to recognize we also live in a sinful world Mm -hmm. where love has been distorted. Mm -hmm. Relationships um, have become more complicated. But where there is a presence of chaos in a relationship, there is a need for a boundary. And then where boundaries are repeatedly violated over and over, then you have to pay attention to asking yourself the question, is this relationship safe? And is this relationship sustainable? And if not, then that's where you have to get educated about 
a goodbye, but it was important to me mm. to go straight to scripture. Love that. And ask, ask ourselves some questions. Like, is it biblical to draw boundaries? And what I discovered is it absolutely is biblical. And not only is it biblical, but boundaries are not just a good idea. They're God's idea. Yeah, that great? And right from the very beginning, God establishes boundaries, even in creation. Mm -hmm. God established a boundary in the first recorded conversation with man when he talked with Adam in the garden about you can eat from all of these trees in the garden, but just not this tree. That was a boundary. Wait, I thought boundaries was a modern idea. The books that are written <laughs> that John Townsend, Henry Cloud, and others wrote. And it's like, I know you've said this many times. Like, it just tickles me. It's like, this is far back as we can go god's a, mm -hmm. a boundary god this is not a new modern idea in pop psychology is mm -hmm. it? Yeah. and do, and god didn't do it to you know overly control the human there was freedom there you remember when he says to adam you are free so it's in the context of freedom mm -hmm, but great. true freedom can never happen if we don't know where the boundary lines are mm -hmm. if we know where the boundary lines are then we run free within the safety of those boundary lines and god mm -hmm. didn't do it to restrict the man and just for a killjoy act of God, you know, he did it to protect the man. And the reason God said, do not eat from this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because God wanted to protect humans from carrying the weight that the human heart was never supposed to carry. And that is the devastating weight of the knowledge mm -hmm. of evil. So, Joel, what do you have to say in all of this from a theological standpoint um, about difficult relationships, destructive relationships, and and just all that we're talking about today, and even emotional abuse. I would just love your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I'm just taking a lot of this in, listening, and I've been taking some notes, and I think one of the interesting things is that as we talk about dysfunctional relationships, um, dysfunctional relationships are evidence of disorder in the relationship. Mm. And when we think about disorder, uh, I, I think the list that you gave us, Lisa, was so helpful, but I, I started to list down some categories. And so if you're in this situation, you're, you're trying to categorize, how, how is this all working out? Um, the categories are uh, power. Is there a pursuit of power? Is there an influence of authority? Is there the presence of addiction? Is there disordered affection? Is there self-obsession? Are those mm. the fuels that are underneath the, the individual that's trying to actually control you, that's actually trying to step in? And the interesting thing is, is theologically, there's this idea of God's sovereignty. And God's sovereignty, my old um, professor, Dr. John Frame, he, he talks about sovereignty in these three ways, that God's uh, power, God's authority, and God's control. And so the presence of emotional abuse, I would even say spiritual abuse, it's actually a hijacking of what is rightfully held in the hands of God, which is safe and secure and can be um, uh, handed out with justice and mercy and compassion. It's taking that out of God's hands and putting it into our own hands and trying to exercise um, our own power, our own authority, our own control, because we become self-absorbed in the process. And so if you're listening and you're, and, and you're experiencing this and, and you're wondering like, gosh, like, is this just dysfunctional? Is this start to look for those patterns, you know, not just in that one area, but then say, okay, is the presence of this also in other areas in, in finances? Is it present yeah. in relationships in our circle of friends? Is there this, this self-serving, like, you know, um, I talked about this the other day with a friend. If, if the, the theme in our minds is what's in it for me, that's a problem. Mm. Because that what's in it for me plays out in our marriages, in our relationships, in our vocations, in all these different areas. And if that's the leading impulse of the human heart, what's in it for me, it's going to result in dysfunction and um, patterns of relationship that are unsustainable. That's wow. so good. So, Jim, is there... Is there a way for us to, to define emotional abuse? Like, is there, are, are there any markers of it or, or some kind of definition where we can make sure we're all on the same page of what is this? Yeah, thank you. I would, I would pay attention to go to oneself, anyone watching or listening to this podcast right now. When someone simply does or says something, this will be a little tricky here, but doesn't do something, meaning there's something they should do or they've committed to do and they don't follow through. They're not keeping their word. Pay attention literally in what know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, your body. And you feel, yeah, this doesn't feel right or 
I don't, I don't like this. I feel kind of some anxiety. Always pay attention, you know, to this, to your body and say, something doesn't feel right. Watch, you've said it many times, including today again. I don't feel safe or something feels distorted. Like I feel like some, I feel kind of messed with right now. I mean, what's really going on here? That's a sign, like a check engine line on the dashboard of your life. And then again, I'm just real big on having a safe friend not an unsafe friend, or a therapist, pastor, whoever, to go and say, you know, this has been gone on to me. My spouse is doing this or not doing that, saying this or not saying that, and I have a check in my spirit. I wonder about this, and I'm coming in curious, not furious, and say, "What? wonder what's going on for me. And what we want there is someone, good therapist do it, is they mirror back. Whoa, what I'm hearing you say is, my little hub I do, mm-hmm. H, I hear you, you, I understand you, and B, I believe you. So they mirror back and say, here's what I'm hearing, and we continue to have dialogue around. I want to get those stories out of my head. I don't want to be in judgment like that. Get them out of my head and and put them on the right board of somebody else sitting across me over a cup of coffee and say, what do you hear me saying or struggling with? It doesn't mean the other person's right, but I want to get it external versus all these internal conversations. And if feeling, and if going to a therapist feels a little bit like, oh no, am mm-hmm. I tattletelling on this other yep. person? Like, I don't want to betray my mom, but I've got some issues with mm-hmm. my mom that I need to check out with a therapist, or I don't want to betray my husband by going to a therapist because that almost feels like I'm going to go and tell things about him that he wouldn't want me to tell. Mm-hmm. If if there's any you of that, how the, right there the person's trapped. Mm. We're all talking about emotionally abusive or destructive or difficult watching the Likert scale I said earlier from one to five rank these things that Lisa has in her book and she's talked about and so inside uh, 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 you just said it I wonder what he will think and all I'm going to do is biblically let someone bear my burdens share this and say what do you think in the multitude of counselors it doesn't have to be a professional in the multitude of counselors, there's wisdom and safety. I'm saying hey I want to check this out about me mm-hmm. keeping me safe not about him An emotionally destructive or abusive person is not spouse in some cases, doesn't want you. It's like a cult. Keep it inside the city. Mm. I mean, don't go tell. So that piece. And that in and of itself is a red flag. It's a red flag. So what would he think? It's like, but I'm not going to tell. My goal is to express and discern in wisdom not to go and betray him. And most women I've worked with, they say, I'll say, come on, what's your what's your thought or your goal? Is it to betray him? Well, no, not at all. I want to process me. There's your answer. And to get educated. Well, of course. You know, it's no secret, Jim, you are my counselor. And you've done such a fabulous job of oh, thank you. absolutely doing exactly what you said, helping me feel understood, helping me feel seen, giving me a place to process yeah. my questions and what is this. And one of the things that's been so helpful is the education you've given me so that I can, instead of things kind of floating around like that doesn't <laughs> feel right or why does this make me feel a certain way or the number one question I asked you for so long, Jim, do you do you think I'm crazy? Like yeah. I see this but then it's being called this and it's just so hard when you don't have the education or the language around no you know what you said no lisa actually this is this is this and so let me give you a couple of by the way a hundred percent of the time when you asked me that you said early on it was on a podcast too that one of the most helpful things i said to god be the glory not me was i said lisa i believe you i was so far in a polar opposite of that Everything you were saying, I'm sitting there going, yep, that makes sense. I believe. I didn't even wrestle not one time in my history with you. You were like, does this make sense? Do you believe? I'm like, totally. And more than you even know. I never once thought, "Uh," I went, yeah. So it wasn't just kind of, well, kind of makes sense. I'm like, totally makes sense. Hmm. That was my response with you. Inside, I'm going, yeah. So let me give you a couple of those terms that really helped me a lot. One is gaslighting. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't want to park here too long, but I do want to give some insight. What is gaslighting? So if you go back, I have it on my iPhone, the Alfred Hitchcock movie. There are actually two movies called Gaslight. And the idea is just think, let's make it more modern with a dimmer switch. Or every night I turn on the lights outside and lock the doors, right? So the woman would set the gas lights, the gas lamps, and say, yeah, I've turned them on, I'm right like that. The guy would come along and he would jack with them, monkey with them, whatever you want to call it, with the lights. She knew 
she her reality was I turned those gas lamps, those gas lights on. He came back and messed with the lights and said, you didn't turn that on. Or you had the dimmer switch set here, but they was on low. And she goes, I know I didn't. So he knew the truth. He did it with the gaslighting has the intent to deceive. The gaslighter knows the truth. And he, in many cases, he is going to do what he can to make you feel crazy up in there. He knows the truth with the intent. So women, uh, we talked before about porn or other things, will say, I found the evidence. It's right here. I know this happened. John, I'm just going to say it. John Edwards is a senator in the state we sit in, in North Carolina. ABC, is, you can see it on YouTube, ABC went in an expose. He was accused of having an affair, and there might be a baby. They had it through the hotel room, through the slat and the blinds. This is on ABC. And they said, we're going to bring up a video we shot, and it's you holding that baby with the woman accused. Here is a U.S. senator, not being pejorative against him. I've never met him. And I'll never forget. They said, and sir, what, Senator, what is your response? He says, it looks like me. It could be me. It's not me. Hmm. Now, he knew very well the truth. That's a v- an example, really, of gaslighting, but you do that in front of America. So it has to have the intent to make intent to make you feel crazy. When I do know the truth, I know exactly what I've done. He knew he monkeyed with those lights, the guy in the gaslight, but he's trying to make you feel crazy, and sadly, it often works. And so really, it's trying to alter reality. So your reality, not real your, reality, because he yes. knows the reality, but he's trying to alter your reality and make you think, maybe, I don't know, I'm crazy. Yeah, and if mental health is a commitment to reality at all costs, Mm -hmm. that's why gaslighting is a form of emotional abuse. Hmm. With zero question, we can just sign and seal that one right now. It definitely is emotionally abusive. Hmm. Hmm. That could be another thing, you know, on your list or the scale is the kind which we've talked about it before. He has gaslighted me. I have proof some women will say that that this was reality. He denied it. And then later, yeah, sorry, proved he did it. Hmm. Right? Yeah. So another one is this, the verbal onslaught of maybe someone's angry and they just come out exploding with words Mm -hmm. that are just incredibly hurtful or they have this passive aggressive nature. That's the one that scares me. Okay. So comment, comment on that because Mm. that's also a form of emotional. Here's what I say y'all is I've gotten, as I've turned 60 and I'm older now and older therapist, Uh, I just do, I make up stuff. And this is what I made up. You know what, bro, I'm not worried about your motive because I don't know if I know. Are you trying to do all this? Mm -hmm. But your modus operandi, your method of operating, well, I got angry. The Bible says it's a command and imperative is be angry, but don't sin. I'm not going to fight him on, well, I wasn't trying. I I get it. Maybe what you don't work out, you'll act out. We know the anger of man doesn't bring about the righteousness of God. So instead of wrestling with him around on, is it his motive to be angry? I'd say, Will you read the room and know your audience? Your wife feels scared and unsafe when you do this. And now I no longer care about your motive. So with that, if a woman, again, in many cases say, do you feel safe? Do you feel threatened? No, I don't feel safe. I do feel threatened when he just raises his voice. And I'm going to say one more little caveat. I work with people with some great compassion on my part, meaning this. I love it when I see people raise their voice, yell, maybe cuss in a session or something else, and uh, and they're getting big, as I call it. And I look and I go, I don't think you're aware how big you are. That's why I love having a therapist in the room to go, may I give you feedback of how, and I'm a dude. Let me tell you how I'm experiencing you. And sometimes the woman has gotten really loud and big, and I say, ma'am, are you, would you let me tell you how I experience you? Mm. And that's data versus two people by themselves. But he may not think, some people would, but he may not think he's getting all big and angry. He may not see it. Plus, anger tends to blind the mind so much that, that I'll be more in that limbic brain that I cognitively don't even think I'm raging right now, and I am. And mm-hmm. what about the passive-aggressive stuff? Well, I think the passive-aggressive, matter of fact, Joe, I'm just going to say I'm confident. I don't even think I think about it, is that is uh, purely by design. Uh, you want to watch out. It's the carbon monoxide in a relationship. It's colorless, odorless, tasteless gas. The Bible says of the man whose words are smooth as oil. Oh, listen to that. But in those words are daggers. Mm-hmm. And so that is more, I think, I believe, is intentional. I'm aware I'm doing it. My job is to spray WD-40 in front of you on a towel floor and watch you slip. I'm going to dysregulate you. I think he is mostly, he or she, largely, if not fully aware that I'm going to do this to get you dysregulated. And mm. again, 
a possible sign of emotional abuse. Absolutely. Check your body. Why do I feel like something's going on here? Why do I, why, I don't even know what's going on. I call you when I call that, I call that relational vertigo. You think mm. of what vertigo does. But there's a relational vertigo. I feel, wow, it's, things are spinning. I don't know. Pay attention to the spinning. And then go talk to someone. Anybody know where the first example of emotional abuse takes place in the Bible? No, but I have a feeling that I would you go do. To, I, would, I would roll dice of Genesis uh, 3 when Satan says, God did God, or God said this not. He mind molested. It was like, what? Yeah. Did I get it I right? I mean, isn't that I so interesting? I want to get it right with the doctor <laughs> here. Seriously. No, is, isn't, that, isn't that right, though? And, and I think what's interesting, this whole time I've been thinking, mm-hmm. sticks and stones will hurt, uh, may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Yeah, right. What a flat-out lie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What a flat-out lie. Yeah. And so the first instance of uh, emotional abuse, well, I would categorize it as a, an emotional manipulation, is actually in Eden, in the place that Adam and Eve should have felt the safest. Wow. There's a lot that's happening in the Old Testament about who is Satan, mm-hmm. what is happening, the type of spiritual being, you know. And but he was passive aggressive, though. He was, like, doesn't he? He was gaslighting he was like, and he was passive aggressive. Yeah. Absolutely. And that is the methodology that was used to disorient and to distract Adam and, it and worked. Eve. And it worked. Here's hmm. the thing that I've always wondered is why didn't Eve just leave? Hmm. Why didn't Why didn't Adam just step why didn't in? Adam man up, and he was told to rule and subdue the garden. Sorry, I call calm down here. So here's 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 what's interesting. I think it's because the battle was presented in a field that they weren't expecting. Oh mm. wow, boy, that'll preach. Like they expected the battle to be out there because God had told them. By the wow, way, go out and multiply, powerful. be a, a king, prophet, priest type of imagery, and go out. The place that they least expected was the safety and security of their own home. And so I think Mm. this is something important for us as we think about emotional Mm. abuse, um, as we think about the danger, why are we so disoriented when this happens, is often it's happening in the places that we least expect it, in the safety and security of the relationships that are supposed to be the most intimate and self-protective, not self-destructive. That's your next book, buddy. (laughs) I'm I'm just stunned. I'm going, wow, to put it that eloquently theologically, I'm going, I'm going to steal that from you. Yeah, it's it's yours. It's yours. Borrow it. Well, and as a woman, I relate to that so much. It reminds me, Joel, um, of, you know, what what a woman's heart longs for. And I'm not going to speak for all women. I'll say what my heart longs for is I want to be known. I want to be seen and thought beautiful. Hmm. And I want to feel safe. I want to I want to have that Genesis to is it Genesis two twenty four Genesis two twenty five like yeah. you know to be able to stand there completely vulnerable and yet completely safe yeah that's what I want and so I think in my mind uh, marriage automatically means that but sometimes it doesn't mm-hmm. yeah. and. I remember you and I having a conversation around um, the verse in Malachi that a lot of people (laughs) toss out of, you know, God God hates divorce. divorce. Yeah, it's it's chapter two. Is it? Yeah. So let's find that verse. That's been weaponized and many other things, hadn't it? Yeah. But um, what you're saying is it's making so much sense to me because. Yeah. 216. Yeah. It it feels very much when you say Adam and Eve experienced a battle in a place that they didn't experience to be attacked, you know, they, they didn't expect to be attacked there. And I think that sometimes happens to women Mm -hmm. or even to men in, in the context of a relationship that's supposed to be so very safe. We, we want to believe the best. And so we keep, we keep trying to say it's safe it's safe it's safe it's safe all the while we're having an experience that is speaking to the opposite of that Hmm. and it can get so complicated but the reason i bring up this verse from malachi is and joel you'll do a better job at this than me but not all versions of the bible say god hates divorce right because it's not how it's translated exactly and what it's translated in some versions of the bible um, and possibly all the way back to the Septuagint, mm-hmm. right? Am mm-hmm. I saying this correctly? Yeah. Is when a man hates and divorces his wife, he does violence, violence. against the one he should protect. To, yeah, that he's supposed to be in covenant love with. Yeah. And, and then there's a little footnote, God hates divorce. But the context of God hating the divorce, if that's even part of the translation, is that when a man 
hates and divorces the very woman he was supposed to love and protect. When a man hates and divorces his wife, he does violence against the one he should protect. And I feel like that is so speaking to everything that we're talking about right now. Yeah, and I mean, there's a lot in translation history and Hebrew kind of, um, uh, you know, construction that's taking place here. Um, we don't find that the language of God hates divorce until the King James Version comes out. And it's absolutely connected to a social phenomena of fear that's taking place. And so I won't go too deep into that, but I will say if you uh, audit any Hebrew scholar... <laughs> And and you say, look at this verse. They'll say, one, it's one of the most difficult verses to translate. But secondarily, absolutely, it is it is implausible. Like, it is not possible to come to a conclusion that God hates divorce based off of the construction of it. There are two possible options. Um, the CSB has it this way. If he is talking about the man, if he hates and divorces his wife, right? So the object of that hatred is his wife. If he hates and divorces his wife, says the God of Israel, and then he talks about injustice. And the other option, which I kind of hold to, is it's actually this ideology that God is on the outside looking at the one who hates his wife and has covenant. And it's actually that God hates that person. Mm. That God's anger, his righteous anger is against the covenant breaker. Not against the institution, but against the one who breaks the institution. Mm, that's really powerful. So, Joel, I know that we were talking earlier um, off camera about Ephesians chapter 5. And I oh, really yeah. liked what you had to say. And I also want to say, I want to recognize that emotional abuse is not the only kind of abuse that happens in a relationship. Oh, you know, there can be sexual abuse, there can be physical, physical abuse. abuse. Um, but for the purpose of our conversation today, the emotional abuse is what we've chosen to focus on. And a lot of the reason that I want to focus on this is because this seems to be this, there's this hesitation to call it what it is. Yeah. And so I want to help people have some handles that if you're experiencing emotional abuse, it is okay to call it what it is. Yeah. So Joel, what do you want to make sure from a theological standpoint that well, we yeah, that's so good, get Lisa. into our conversation? I, I would say one of the big ones and the big questions that I get personally, uh, either through Instagram or through tickets here at Proverbs is uh, when this conversation comes up is the quote is, well, Joel, what about Ephesians 5.22? Too, right uh, and it says this wives submit to your husbands as to the lord because the and 23 because the husband is the head of the wife as christ is the head of the church he's the savior of the body so the question is well if i'm in this abusive relationship mental you know emotional whatever it might be then am i actually disobeying god because mm. i'm supposed to submit to to my husband right so this is a basic hermeneutical how we study the bible principle that i want us to point out one we can never read one verse by itself we have to look at its context interestingly in verse 20 it says this giving thanks always for everything to god the father in the name of the lord jesus christ and then verse 21 submitting to one another this is talking about the christian community the faith the faithful that love jesus submitting to one another in the fear of christ so before we can even get to a household hierarchy or a household ordering, we have to deal with the fact that the first way that we're ordered in our um, relationships mm -hmm. is ultimately first and foremost to Christ. Because we fear Christ that it sets everything else in order. And then um, interestingly in verse 22, the Greek word, word, uh, word for submit isn't even there, but it's being supplied by verse 21. So it should be there. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. What this is talking about, Lisa uh, and Jim, is in the Greco-Roman world, like in any society, there's structure and order. There are bosses and there are employees, employers and employees, right? There are people that have authority that we s submit to. A police officer pulls us over. It's wise for us to pull over when the lights go on. That's a form of submission. Mm -hmm. It's it's recognizing a type of authority. So what Paul is saying is, by the way, in the social structure of the world, there is a type of right order. And then this is what he does. He says, but we have to order ourselves based off of how Christ has given us a vision of this order. So he says, wives, submit, rightly order yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of the body. Now catch this. Verse 24, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands and everything. And then 25, which interestingly is always missed, right? Yeah, conveniently. Husbands, <clears throat> notice this. It says, husbands, love your wives. Now, if I'm Paul, I'm thinking, wait a minute, this is unfair. 
Why in the world do wives have to submit to their husbands, but then husbands, all they got to do is love your your wives, just as Christ loved the church? Notice the, dis- the descriptor, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. W- one is really important that Paul says, submit and not obey. Hmm. Submit and not obey. Obey would have been a word that was used to children in households that requires blind type of obedience. Hmm. That is not present. It's a type of right ordering. And then secondarily, why does Paul use love and not submit for men? Because he actually takes a situation in a cultural context where men would never do this. They would. Ne- they are the authority. They're the power. They're the control. They would never show this type of Christ-like love. And Paul says, actually, your call, men, is even greater and grander. It's more important than even the submission. It is an agape type of love. And if you want to know what this love looks like, it's the same love Mm. that obediently, faithfully, and joyfully took Jesus the Messiah to walk a road to a cross, endure 39 lashes, and submit himself, even obedience to death. That is is the type of love that a man should have for his wife, that that should be ordered and structured. And I just have this impulse and this belief. I think this whole submission thing, all of a sudden, becomes so easy and so mutually beneficial if it's rightly ordered the way that Paul gives it to us. When Paul says one another, he uses a reciprocal pronoun. And um, reciprocity is required. It means at the same way that I show love and affection to the other person, the expectation is that person will show love and affection back to me. Here's the problem with reciprocal pronouns. They break instantly when the reciprocity isn't shown back. Wow. Hmm. It is faithful, mutual, self-loving, self-giving affection that was modeled by Christ. And that's expected of us in our relationships. Hmm. And so if you're wondering right now, like, whoa, 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 Joel, I think I'm supposed to to, to submit. Notice this, that in Acts 5, 29, Peter says uh, to all these people, he says, we must obey God rather than men. That affirms what I just talked about earlier in Ephesians 5, 20 and 21. And so the, the minute, the instant <laughs> that the person that you love acts in abusive, manipulative, self-harming, image of God breaking ways towards you, your higher superior allegiance is a submission to Christ out of fear. And it's a type of love that you express to that person that you now go into your boundaries and establish peace, Romans 12, 18, as possible for you. And I'll say, you know, the minute a lot of women hear that word submission, they bristle. Yeah. And <laughs> they kind of push back and just say, okay, come on. I mean, haven't we <laughs> progressed in our modern day past that? Mm-hmm. And I I get why there's some pushback with mm-hmm. that because I do think submission has been so greatly misunderstood and it's hard to talk about submission in the same conversation that we're talking about emotional abuse but I think ultimately what I hear you saying is we honor what is honorable and when there is dishonorable actions taking place to be obedient to God we must pursue a peace that maybe that relationship has has not been fostering and maybe will not foster. And Joel, I know you have a really good verse about we are called by God to pursue peace. Yeah, yeah it's Romans 12, 18. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's really important. And Paul's talking to a church in Rome that is um, really having all kinds of issues. And this is what he says, if possible. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, the construction of this is really important. If possible, Paul assumes and he presumes that it might not be possible. Hmm. Right? So that's the first clause. The second, and this feels unfair. He says this, as far as it depends on you. And everybody's like, why does it always got to be me? 
I'm tired of this, but but this is actually a safety net that Paul's giving you. It's actually relief. It means you're only responsible for what you can be responsible for. And anything outside of your scope of responsibility is no longer your effort or your um, your responsibility. So it's actually uh, a sense of peace that you can have for it. And he says this, what's the aim? To live at peace with everyone. Uh, peace is both the the presence of calm but it's also the absence of chaos. And so yeah. sometimes peace means that you can set boundaries in place and you can be physically present and, and you can navigate through that. But sometimes, I think this is what Paul's getting on here, if possible, so far as it depends on you. Sometimes the only way to experience this type of peace, this type of shalom, is actually the removal of your presence for a time or for a season so that healthy relationships can abound. Hmm. Thank you for that. Okay. So I do clearly want to say that we are not having an egalitarian versus complementarian right. uh, discussion today, right? Yeah, maybe we, someday, but not today. <laughs> maybe someday, but not today. But we just want to be faithful with the text that's in front of us. And in the context of emotional abuse, we want to help people who yeah. are experiencing this. Um, and I would say, Lisa, it, have, I know many, many scholars and dear friends who are on both sides, mm -hmm. egalitarian and complementarian, and they would all go to this place and say, yes, God God requires and he needs the people of God to live in mutually um, self-giving, self-loving and healthy relationships. And he would never, ever require of us to stay in relationships that are abusive, that are harmful or discredit our uh, Imago Dei. Thank you for that. OK, last thoughts, Jim, on all that we've talked about today. And we have talked about a lot. I'm just excited. This is my last thought of I get this with Joel a lot of just how, to use the term practical, the Word of God is. And when I hear the, the, for me, a landing place of, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We know the Word of God. He's called us to peace. That I am thankful, ready, right? I'm thankful that my wife, when I was verbally and emotionally abusive for too many years, mm -hmm and quoted scripture at her, because I've got a lot, quite frankly, a lot of Bible verses memorized, and weaponized those, that she loved me enough to begin to have her appropriate, Jesus-filled voice and say, I don't feel safe, I'm not doing that anymore, and because of that, it ha helped me realize I might lose her and the family break up and whatever else, and I realized I hated her first for it. That's honest, we've talked about that, she and I have. And then I realized she loved me so much to say, I want to call forth the best Jim that I can help call forth. It's up to Jim to walk out, right? Mm -hmm. She had a vision for me. And so, yeah, she had a time where she, in essence, separated from me just in her mind and her soul to go, I'm not going along with this anymore. And we live today in a redeemed story because she did not co-sign my toxic behavior. And uh, that's my takeaway. And my ending is I'm thankful for a wife who was the true Ezra Konegdo to me. Mm -hmm. Here's where I want to land today. And that is you need to decide for yourself. This is what I am willing to accept. And this is what I'm unwilling to accept. Mm -hmm. And I need to factor biblical truth in that. And I need to factor in um, therapeutic truth into that, but this is what I'm willing to accept. And this is what I'm not willing to accept. And maybe in some cases, this is what I'm no longer willing to accept. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is what I will do. And this is what I will not do. Hmm. This is what I will tolerate. And this is what I will not tolerate. Or in some people's cases, I will no longer tolerate. That sounds like the Bible doesn't it? let your yes be yes. Not, uh, let your yes be yes and your no be no. As you say that, I go, there it is again mm -hmm. in the Bible. Joel, any closing thoughts? And we'll end with you today. Um, you know, I, I would just say my closing thought is that God loves you. He desires the best for you and um, that he made you in his likeness and in his image. And in saying that, um, it is vitally, vitally important that we do everything in our power to honor that image. Um, and some of these things might be difficult, but at the end of it, it is so worth it because no matter what man says, if we honor God at the end of the day, 
and he is mm-hmm. loved and he is cherished and he's honored and worshiped by us um, in these very practical ways, I think it's a winsome witness to a world that is wondering, is this even possible? Wow. And it is. And we get to be the light that shows that. Amen. Amen.